with you today. If you got a Bible, go ahead and meet me at Mark chapter 7. We're looking at verse 31 through 37. Right out the gate, I just want to say this over your life today. This just feels really significant this morning. Look, I don't know what you walked in here with. I don't know the baggage. I don't know the pain. I don't know the discouragement. I don't know the joy, the triumph, the victory that you walked in here with. But what I do know is this, that if you are a believer in Jesus, your best days are yet to come. That he is doing things in your life that you don't know, that you can't see. I just want to declare this over you, that your best days are ahead of you, that Jesus is in the room. And how many of you know that because he's here in our midst, all things are possible? Is your faith turned up today? Anybody expected for God to move in this house this morning? All right, let's go. We're going to look at Mark chapter 7, a guy that encounters Jesus in a way that changes his life. Of course, this is just like every week. This is what I love about New Song, guys. We see the same thing happen literally every single week. People meeting Jesus and experiencing radical transformation. And uh, this morning is going to be no exception. Look at Mark chapter 7, verse 31 and 32. I'm going to start out right here. It says this, Then Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to Jesus a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on on him. All right, so stage is now set for the rest of the time this morning. You've got a group of people uh, who have a friend who is deaf. He has a speech impediment. His body is messed up. He has infirmity. He has sickness. We don't know how long he's been in this condition, but the one thing that we do know that's really critical and really the only thing that you need to know about this guy is he's got a problem and he's got a crazy group of friends that know that Jesus is the solution and they are willing to make that connection point however they can. Guys, and this is... By the way, as far as we can get our vision statement up here, our vision as a church is a thriving spiritual family. You want to know what that means? That doesn't mean that we're all perfect and well-to-do and put together and nobody has issues in the church. You want to know what a thriving spiritual family centered around Jesus looks like? It looks like that. It looks like a crazy group of people that are messed up and broken saying, hey, look, in the midst of our own brokenness, we know the one guy who's not messed up and we're gonna continue to bring each other towards him, right? That's what it means to actually be a thriving spiritual family. I, I, got a, uh, I have a mentor of mine who was telling me this story a while ago about his church who uh, they experienced a lot of growth. And let me just say this, as a pastor, church growth is the most wonderful, awesome, horrible, painful thing that you will ever experience in your entire life. And uh, he, he was talking to me about this season where his church was growing a lot and they had just a lot of people coming to meet Jesus. And there was this one Sunday where he got a letter from one of the neighbors because the church parking lot was so full. People had to park in the surrounding neighborhoods. This is what I am praying for to get this type of email here at New Song. What happened was there was this guy who was late to church, nowhere to park in the parking lot, parks on this dude's yard because he doesn't know where else to park. Guy comes out and his PJs with his coffee and he's yelling at him like, you can't park there. The guy looks back at him, flips him off and says, shut up, I'm late for church and runs into the church building, (laughs) right? That's epic. Guys, that's the kind of email that I want, all right? Like just exactly like that. This is the church, guys. It's not full of perfect people that are put together because here's the thing. What I know about some of you is on the way to church, you fought on the way in. You were just ripping each other up and you walked in the doors and what did you do? Oh, hey, praise God, brother. Good to be here. (laughs) This is what you did. You just, it's like everything's totally fine now because we're in church. No, no, no. Guys, you want to know where the power of God is? You want to know how to be a people that experiences the power of God? It's where there's vulnerability. It's where there is transparency. It's where there is authenticity. It's where we see one another fully, completely in our weaknesses, in our brokenness, and we refuse to give up on each other because we've got that same brokenness in our own soul, and we just continue to bring each other to Jesus is the one true answer. You want to know how to be a people filled with the power of God? That's it, right? We, this, and by the way, for your home group, for those of you that are in a home group, this is exactly what it looks like, right? It, you are not going to mature as a follower of Jesus. You, let me say it this way. You will only mature as a follower of Jesus to the level of your own authenticity, 
with God and with other people. This is how it works. The dude had a choice. His friends showed up. They, notice, it was like they didn't even, this wasn't even up for debate. They just showed up, grabbed the guy, and kidnapped him, right? This is what it means to be a thriving spiritual family, that we kick the door down on each other, that you don't let each other suffer in silence, that you be somebody that actually carries the burden and the weight of other people in life, and you bring them to Jesus when they don't know where he is and they don't know how to get there. And at the same time, you experience that from others. Guys, this is what it means to be the church, right? And so stage is set. We got the guy. He's got a hearing issue. He's deaf. He can't speak. He's mute. And his buddies bring him to Jesus. Notice the rest of the uh, uh, passage. We're going to read verses 33 through 37. This is the effect of this encounter that he has with Jesus. We'll talk about it for a few minutes here today. And taking him aside from the crowd privately... Jesus put his, this is the craziest miracle, I think, in the entire Bible, all right? So buckle up, uh, this is wild. He puts his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue. All right, so that's in red. This is what Jesus did. This is in your Bible. And looking up to heven, he sighed and said to him, F fatha, that sounds like a cuss word in Greek. That is, be open, and his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it, and they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Now, there's a lot going on here, guys, and unfortunately, I've only got time to talk to you about like three things, which is so horrible and miserable about the fact that I only get to preach at you for 40 minutes a week. But here's, here's what I want to say as we enter into this. Every time I get up here and I take this pulpit, here's what you need to know about what goes on in my heart and my mind. I am not trying to impress you. I'm, my goal here today is not that you would like me more, like what I said this week more than last week. You guys know how I feel about the comment of good, good sermon pastor, right? I want to slap you in the face. Don't ever say that to a preacher. That's an insult, dude. I'm not trying to preach a good sermon. I'm trying to wreck you with the goodness of God, get you to encounter him in a way that makes you walk out those doors with greater love for Jesus and greater trust in Jesus, a greater dependence on Jesus, and a greater lean on him. That's why we're here. And what I want to do today is get you to encounter the Jesus of Mark 7 that shows up in incredible, because he's here, guys, right? And this is what he wants to do in the context of your life. And ultimately, what you need more than anything in all of life, you want to know what it is? It's trust in God. More than anything you have in all of life, need of, what you and I need more than anything, it really is trust in Jesus. And so what I want to ask you right out the gate, where is your trust in Jesus today? All right, I mean, just, just think about it. Where's your trust at? When you think about Jesus and you survey your life, where's your trust at? Where are you withholding trust? Where are you giving trust? Because let me just say this. I, I mentioned this to first service. Uh, the measure of trust that you extend to him will always be proportionate to the level of freedom you experience. Are you with me? All right, let me say that one more time. Why trust is so important. The level of trust that you have for Jesus is always proportionate to the measure of freedom that you experience. Because when you trust Jesus with your marriage, when you trust Jesus with your family, when you trust Jesus with your brokenness, when you trust Jesus with your sin, with your addictions, with the pain and the suffering and the issues of your life, when you come to him like this group of people and say, oh God, lay your hand on me in this area. You know what always happens? The power of God shows up. The the level of trust that you all that you have as a believer in Jesus is always directly proportionate to the amount of freedom that you experience. So where's your trust at? How's your trust? Do you trust him? Where are you withholding trust? Because Jesus is after a greater measure. And I want to show you today why you can trust him. In fact, uh, Dr. Henry Cloud, he wrote this book recently called Trust. And uh, it's a really great resource. He talks about basically the big idea of the book is this. Whether you like it or not, trust is the fuel for all of life. So he talks about how you're hardwired to trust. When you have a baby, uh, if you're a female, what happens is you develop this intense trust bond with this child where uh, everybody came into this world completely dependent. Like if you didn't have people that cared for you, loved you, gave you what you needed, you would be dead. Like you wouldn't be here because a baby can't do anything for themselves, right? Like welcome to second 
second grade, this is how the human condition works. And so what happens for a baby is you have, they get hungry and they, ah, bring it to me. And then they get fed and then they get soothed. And over time, what neuroscience will tell us is this is why being a mother is so incredible for those of you that have experienced that. What happens as your baby cries and experiences hunger and distress and is met by soothing and food and substance and warmth, what happens over time, neuroscience will say that it becomes these trust bonds take up physical space on the inside of their brains and essentially an internal mother develops so that the child can then self-soothe without the mother present. So you came into this life completely dependent, complete, you had no other option but to trust. There's all this research that he came out with of, on saying, you know, like it had, it's directly proportionate to the level of physical and mental health. If you are a low trust person, the likelihood of experiencing anxiety and depression for you is actually higher. It affects your physical body. Teams that have high trust outperform 10 times out of 10, low trust teams. All across the board in life, trust fuels everything. And what happens, and let me be real with many of you, what happened for all of us, you have given trust, you have given trust away, and it's been used, and it's been misused, and it's been abused, and you've been hurt. And so what we do, and he talks about this in the book, is we develop these guardrails, these boundaries, we separate, we end up saying stupid stuff like this. Let me know if you've ever said this. I'll never trust anybody again, right? I'm never going to give my heart away to somebody again, you know, because they, they just shattered me. It's like, yeah, okay. I mean, think about what you're saying, though, for a second. Like, okay, have fun being single, depressed, and lonely for the rest of your life. That hardly sounds like a better alternative. This is how life works. It works in trust. You can think that you don't trust anybody. You trust people every single day of your life. You got coffee, you trust the dude not to poison it. You know what I mean? Like you literally operate with trust every single day of your life. And what happens for many people, in fact, there's another uh, book uh, about deconstruction, fascinating book, where he talks about essentially what happens is people are in the church. This is how this plays out with you and Jesus. Oftentimes, Christians misrepresent Jesus or fake Christians misrepresent Jesus. And then we take that as, oh, this must be what God is like because here, his, here are his people. Or you have a bad experience or you go through something difficult in life. And how could a good God allow me to go through something like this? And what you do, same thing. You wall up. You separate. Suffering, the power of suffering, everybody, and hardship in your life it either does one or two things. It's either gonna be what brings you to Jesus to experience freedom or what repels you away from him. And ultimately the choice is yours. And what dictates how you handle that is trust. So I'm gonna ask you again, where's your trust at? Do you trust Jesus's good motive and intention in your life? Dr. Henry Cloud talks about the five things that make up trust. One of them is motive. Do you trust the things that he is doing in your life are for your good and his glory? Do you trust that he can use the brokenness and the pain and the hurt for your good and for his glory? Because if you do, that's what's gonna get you out of bed when you can't stand. Right there, do you trust him? Where's your trust at? Motive, let's talk about motive for a second because this happens all the time. So I'm married, been married for uh, coming up on almost a decade. Wow, getting old. And thank you. I really appreciate it. It's been very difficult for me. I'm just joking. No, it's amazing. <laughs> My wife is incredible. Uh, and uh, I remember a while ago, and I'm going to be careful here because she's in the service, as you guys know, so you can pray for me right now. Um, but a while ago, my, I don't even think you know I was going to tell this story. A while ago, we got in a fight. It was a big fight. It was a really great fight. And what happened was, I'm a great husband, so I went up to my wife, and I was like, hey, babe, so, you know, how can I love you more? Because like, I'm a great husband. I'm like, how can, how can I love you more? Like, help me, help me understand. You know, because I read, like, Dr. Gary Chapman, Five Love Languages, and I realized, like, I haven't been doing this, so I got to figure out how do, you, how do you receive love? What does it look like? So I'm asking her, what does it look like? And I was like, you know, so you, you're constantly posting this stuff on Instagram, social media. I hate social media. I think it's a disaster. Everybody should burn it to the ground. And Mark Zuckerberg might be the Antichrist. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm talking to my wife. How can I, you seem to do this stuff on, online where you post about me and the kids' family stuff. Like, would it mean something to you if I did that? Would that help you feel loved if I just shout my love for you from the rooftops into the social media stratosphere? And she's like, well, you know, it'd be nice. And I could tell, like, yes, that's what she's looking for. And so what I do is I leave that conversation, guys. 
I summon the fullness of my poetic powers. I come up with this, like I'm waxing eloquent here. It's charming, it's witty, there's humor. I'm confessing my undying love for my wife. It's this wonderful piece of art, right? With this picture that I have that I post up and I send it into the world and I say, I love my wife so much, okay? So I do that, tag her in it. I was sure to tag her in it so she could see it. And ultimately what happens, no, nothing, right? I post it, I don't get anything, right? And I'm like, okay, that's kind of weird. Go on with the day. Several hours go on and on and on. I go back home, I'm talking with my wife. I'm like, surely she's gonna mention this thing, right? Surely she's gonna say something about what I posted on Instagram today. And so I'm talking about nothing. Like we're going to, how's your day? It's good, you know, how's your day? Did anybody say anything nice to you today? And she's like, that's a weird <laughs> question. I don't really know. <laughs> we get to the end of the conversation and I look at her and I'm like, babe. She's like, what? Did, well, did you see what I did? Like, did you see what I posted online about you today? And she's like, oh yeah, that? Well, I thought you, I thought you did that because you felt like you had to. Right. Come, on. Come, on. Come on, fellas. Come on, fellas. What would she say? What's she saying? She's saying, Taylor, I don't just care about what you do, but I care about why you do what you do. You're a fraud. You're a phony. It wasn't legit. You do that in two months, and then you'll prove to me that you're actually, like, actually care about me, okay? And I didn't do that, and unfortunately. Maybe I should do that. You know what? I'm going to do something today, all right? I'm going to do something. I'm gonna... Okay, so this is, this, is, this is marriage. This is all of life, right? You don't care just about what people do, but why they do what they do. And so the question for you and I is, because this is an intense passage, guys. I'm going to show you why in just a second. Do you trust his motive in your life? Do you trust that Jesus Christ has said, you're good over mine? Because if you do, there is nothing. Oh, man, I just sense Holy Spirit on this so much. If you, if you are saying, I trust you, Jesus, that when you look at me, you're saying my good over yours, there is nothing that you cannot square off with in life because his good, he's good, and his motive is for you. So can you, can you trust him? Let's look at this text in three different ways. So I wanna tell you this, Jesus always heals. He shows up to heal. The question is, how does he heal? We see it, three things. He heals personally, he heals compassionately, and he heals directly. This is what Jesus wants to do in the context of your life. This is why you can trust him. So you came in here, whatever number you put on the trust scale with Jesus, maybe you're three or four out of 10, you're gonna walk out of here at 10 out of 10 because Jesus, how does he heal? He heals personally, he heals compassionately, and he heals directly. Let's break this up, talk about it. What do I mean by personally? How can you trust Jesus's motive in your life? Well, look, look what he does here. He, he heals the guy personally. Notice it says that he pulls him aside. If Jesus was trying to prop himself up, he would have healed this man in the public view of everybody. What does he do? He pulls him aside. What's he saying? I refuse to use you for my own good gain and renown and fame. You ever been used by somebody? You ever feel like somebody's ever used you just a kid ahead in life and then all of a sudden like guard drops and you kind of see the truth of what was going on here and you're just like, wow, that sucks. I trusted you and I realize now that you were just using me to get ahead in life. I wanna tell you this, Jesus will never do that with you. And he proves it with this guy. Like, do you see that? If Jesus was all about him, like, you know, getting more famous and, hey, look at me, guys, and how awesome I am, he would have just healed the dude with the word out in public and everybody would have been like, oh, Jesus, look at this guy and how amazing he is. But he removes him from the crowd. If Jesus would have healed the guy in view of everybody, dude, he would have been getting invited to all the Gentile conferences. He's in the circuit. He's flying private jets with Kenneth Copeland, sipping Don Perignon, going to the conference. He's got his face freaking printed on a t-shirt, getting passed out with the bazooka guns. This is Jesus, what he has on the other end of him. If he heals this guy out in public, but he doesn't, he pulls him back and develops a secret history with him that only him and this man know about, where Jesus is proving to him, I will never use you for my own gain. Do you understand that about Jesus? This is what he always comes to do in the context of your life. This is personal. This is private. Jesus cares about this man deeply more than himself, and he cares about him at the expense of his own potential uh, fame growing and ministry growing. 
Nobody has done that for you. See, because here's what I'm trying to say. It's one thing, guys. <laughs> it's one thing to know that God loves us corporately as the church, right? It's like, oh yeah, God loves us. I can still be deistic and removed from your life, right? It's like, oh yeah, the church, like Jesus loves the church. He died for the church. But can I, like, do you understand? It's, it's something altogether different to understand that he loves you personally, that this is personal, that he sees yeah, like he sees the dude's issues. Like you're deaf, you can't talk, you know, like, and, and this has marked you for your life. You've been a spectacle your entire life. I'm not gonna put more shame on you and embarrass you in front of everybody. I'm gonna pull you aside because I know exactly what you need. This is deeply, profoundly personal. It's one thing to say God loves us all corporately. It's another thing for you to be able to look in his direction and say, I see the smile of Jesus over my life. I, not because I'm good, but because he's good. Do you see that, right? Because if you don't, you're never gonna trust him. And if you think that God only deals with us corporately, then you're not gonna trust him, right? But do you understand, this is what Jesus does. He always deals with us personally. My question for you is, do you have a secret history with God that only you and him know about? Where he's ministered to you, He's spoken to you. And, and many of you, if you're here, you've been a Christian maybe for a lot of years, and your answer is, no, what am I trying to do? I'm not trying to put shame on you. I'm not trying to guilt you. What I'm saying is you may have some wrong ideas about the goodness of God in the context of your life that's just shut down for this personal ministry of Jesus. And you said, well, no, surely he can't deal with what's in me. Surely he doesn't want to. No, listen, I'm telling you, he does. It's another thing completely altogether for you to understand this is, this is about me. This is me and Jesus. This is Jesus saying, I know what you need, Taylor. I'm going to give it to you. Let's retreat here and let's have a talk. Have you experienced that? When you do, trust goes up because you see his motive is good and it's right and it's true and the guard comes down. He always works personally. Number two, compassionately. What do I mean? Jesus heals compassionately. I don't know if you noticed this or not, but this was a super weird miracle. Okay, so Jesus pulls a deaf guy into the equivalent of like a back alley and gives him essentially a wet willy, spits on his tongue, and he yells at a deaf guy. All things you should not do unless you're God. Amen? Amen. Usually yelling at deaf people is not a good idea. Okay, like, like I'm just going to throw a flag on that and say you're kind of a jerk and should probably never do that again if you've ever done that. But what is Jesus doing? This is a crazy miracle. He's looking up to heaven. He's sighing. He's yelling. He's <laughs> fingers and ears. He's spitting, touching. T What's going on here, guys? Have you noticed? Have you noticed that all of Jesus' healing miracles are different in the gospel of Mark so far? Some, Mark chapter 2, you guys remember what this group of friends did? They ripped a hole in a roof and dropped their buddy down to get a meeting with Jesus. And he forgives his sin before he heals him. That was unique. That was weird. Jesus, he's here because he's paralyzed. And you just forgave his sin. It was a unique moment for that guy. Uh, you've got last week, the Syrophoenician woman, her daughter is demonized. She has a demon. Her, the, the daughter's mom goes to Jesus and says, I need you to heal my daughter. Jesus isn't even with the daughter. He speaks to the mom. It's like, your daughter's healed. Your faith has made her well. Go your way. She goes home and she's delivered from the demon. He wasn't even there. He didn't lay hands on her. Sometimes Jesus speaks directly to the person. Stretch out your hand. And he takes his withered hand and he extends it and he regains mobility in his hand again. Every single miracle of Jesus consistently is different. Sometimes he touches, sometimes he speaks, sometimes he's not even there. The question is why? Right? Have you ever thought about that? Why? What, like, because here's the thing, guys. This is where charismatics get themselves in trouble because we say stuff like, well, you know what? Here's the formula for how you get healed. All right, you got to do this, 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 and this, and this. And then we're going to go through the prayer of Jabez. And then we're going to bust out the frankincense oil. And that didn't work. And the reason why it didn't work is because I've got this, I've got this myrrh oil that is imported from the Holy Land that was blessed by this messianic priest guy. And this is why, right? We, we get formulaic. We get weird. We get the high Hyper spiritual, and this is why you can never put God in the box, because he because why he knows exactly what the person needs, and he contextualizes himself to them in a way of their immediate need. Do you see that? 
he always gives exactly what the person needs. And so what's going on with this guy that's deaf and mute? Well, he can't hear, but what Jesus is doing is he's saying, look, my power is always gonna work in operation in your life in the context of trust and faith. And he's giving him something to hang on to. He's saying to this deaf man, do you trust that at my touch, your ears can be open? Faith would have exploded in this man's heart. Do you trust that as I touch your tongue, the power of God can flow through me and you can be healed? Do you trust that as I look to heaven and I sigh that I'm talking to God on your behalf and that everything can change? Do you? He's contextualizing himself to exactly what the person needs. This is how Jesus always operates. He meets us at the level of our greatest need. And he sighs. He sighs. Isn't it a really interesting detail that Mark puts in there? All right, what, what's, what's Jesus sighing for? Can I tell you, this is another reason why I want you to trust Jesus and, and release all of those areas in your life that you're withholding trust to Jesus. What's he doing? He's sighing. He's saying this deaf, mute man is standing before God and Jesus is sharing his pain with him. He's saying this ought not be. This was never my good plan and intention. Your ear should have never broke. Your tongue should have never broke. You've been a spectacle your entire life. That should have never happened. You live in shame and condemnate all sorts of things. You're a mess. Jesus is like, that should have, this was never my plan. He's stepping into the pain of the man, sighing, carrying it as his own. Why does Paul say in Galatians, bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ? What, what does that even mean? That means thriving spiritual family. What does that look like? You get up underneath the burden and the pain of other people and you carry it, you shoulder it like it's your own, right? You don't say, oh, like, hey, praying for you, brother. No, you're not. Shut up. Like, you're not. Like, I know it sounds good over a text, like, praying for you, man. No, you're not. Okay, you maybe just say one thing. But Jesus is like, no, look, I want you to pray for each other. Yes, that's really good. Get underneath the burden and the pain and carry it like it's your own. Why? That's because that's what Jesus always does for you. That's what he does for us. This is this dude squaring off with the goodness of God. God saying, I'm carrying your pain. It's my own. He looks to heaven and he sighs. He experiences the broken. Now, let me, okay, because here's, here's why this is really important, okay? Because uh, if, you're, if you're a counselor or if you know of a counselor uh, or a therapist, right, you know this. You have a dirty little secret, Okay, I'm gonna tell everybody your dirty little secret. Your di I never do this, all right? When I'm with you guys, I never do this. But the dirty little secret is this, that when you're with a counselor or therapist, it comes to a point where they sort of, sh they sort of shut you off. That's the dirty secret of counseling. Because one of two things, it's like I have no idea what you're saying right now and you sound crazy uh, and I'm lost. Or number two, it's, it's actually a defense mechanism that says I can't actually carry this with you any further because this is gonna wreck me and this is gonna eat me alive. And I'm gonna take this home to my marriage and my family and I have to actually keep you out here, right? That's, that's what happens and that's good and that's right and that's true because ultimately you need Jesus more than anybody, Amen. And, and here's, here's, here's what he's saying, guys. He, here's, here's what's going on in the text. This is God saying, yeah, like in view of that, I will never shut you off. Do you get, are you with me? This is Jesus saying to you and I, I'm never gonna shut you off. As long, Daryl Johnson says it this way, as long as there are tears to shed, Jesus Christ will cry them with you. He's not far off and removed from your pain. He always draws near with the heart of compassion and he never turns you off. You wanna know why you can trust him? Right there, he sighs. He's looking at the pain and the brokenness of your life and he's sighing. He's carrying it with you and saying, I wanna do something about this. Octavius Winslow, how would you like that name? Uh, sounds like a Marvel villain, you know, Octavius Winslow. Anyways, he says this. You wrote a whole sermon about this called The Sigh of Christ. And in it, he says this. I want you to find yourself in this because this is incredible. This is where you're going to get some freedom today. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you believe that? Okay, so he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. This tells us no ebb in the tide of your love, no trembling of the needle of your faith 
can create the slightest variation in his love for you. Your waywardness has not chilled, but only stirred it. Your fickleness has not harmed it, nor your sinfulness forfeited. For he is ever the same. Though we are faithless, he is faithful, and he cannot deny himself. I think so much of the challenge of the believer is to come to the point of recognition that says, I'm not going to be the first one that God screws up on. I'm, I'm not going to be the first one in thousands of years of church history that a promise hits the ground on. I'm not going to be the first. Like, he's got a pretty solid track record of faithfulness through the generations at this point, guys. And how arrogant and ignorant of us to say, I'm so messed up, I'm the one that's going to break that, Right? I mean, th and this is, what, this is what he's saying. This is why you don't have to worry because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his heart is full of compassion for you. So he deals with us. He heals compassionately. Third, last, he heals directly. Do you want to know what is so compelling about Jesus and why you can trust him and why you need him in your life more than anything else? I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. You don't want to hear this. But here's what Jesus does. He deals with us directly. You want to know what he does? He always puts his finger right on the disease. Why is he touching the ear? Why is he touching the tongue? He always puts his finger right on the disease. This is what he always does. He doesn't pretend like it's not there, like many of us would like us to do, because some of you, let's be real, you are so conflict averse, you're just like any, any rumor of it, and you're like, nah, you know, like peace at all costs, right? Jesus doesn't do that. He puts his finger right on it. He goes up to the dude. He doesn't like have a conversation. Well, I can't because the guy's deaf, but you know, hear me out here for a second. He doesn't go up to people and like, hey, you know, how's your day? How you doing? No, he's like, finger on it. Here's the problem. Here's the issue. I've come to solve it. If there was a problem, go, I'll solve it. Anyways. <laughs> no. All right. Okay. What is that song? What was that? Why did that just come to my mind? Vanilla Ice, let's go, just made a drop in the pulpit at New Song. That's proof Jesus is coming back, everybody, right there. Okay, so, right, that's, that's what he, he always puts his finger right on the disease. Do you trust him to do that? Are you allowing him to do that in the context of your Life, because here's, let's be real, guys. Nobody, and nobody likes feedback, right? Nobody likes criticism because you and I have this horrible thing called an ego. And whenever that is threatened or attacked, we go, you know, we get crazy. And it's like, how dare you uh, help me come in contact with the fact that I am imperfect and I'm, I actually have issues? Uh, no, thank you. You're, you're the problem, right? That's what we do. This is what an ego does. And, and so we bring that into our relationship with Jesus. And, and we don't actually allow him to bring about a work of transformation because we're just arrogant and prideful. And you want to know why? It's because you don't actually trust his motive. Because see, here's the thing. This is what he always does. I'm telling you this is what he does. And he always puts his finger right on the disease, okay? Right on the pain, right on the brokenness. Do you let him do it? Yes or no? I'll tell you why you answer that way. It's because you either trust or you don't trust his motive. This is either incredibly intimidating, this is God showing up, and either, look at this, what is this? Many of you, you grew up with that dad in the house, right? And, and, and it's just, it, you always just beat down and beat up and look at all the ways that you've done wrong and all the wrong that you've done, and, and he puts the finger on it. It's not that he's not necessarily wrong, but it's, it's just authoritative and cold and hard, and you are wrong, and look at this. You're, you're so acclimated to that voice, and you brought that into your relationship with Jesus. It, so it can be incredibly intimidating, but it can also be the most liberating thing that you've ever experienced, and all comes down to motive. What is he doing? Is he trying to shame you, or is he trying to heal you? What does he do with the guy? He deals with it directly, and he heals him. Why can you trust Jesus? He doesn't put his finger, are you listening? He doesn't put his finger on the disease to further wound you, but to heal you. He, man, he goes direct, right? He's just, he's just like, we're hitting this thing. But it's not to further wound. It's to actually bring deep and profound healing to 
your life. Last week we were talking about, you know, the question of like, where, where are you building your life? Is it on the judgment of God or mercy of God? What are you more convinced of? Are you more prepped and ready and expecting and putting faith and trust in the judgment of God or the mercy of God coming towards you? I know a lot of believers, you're well-intentioned, right? You want to follow Jesus, you love Jesus, you read your Bible, you go to church, and you are actually proving that you know nothing of the goodness and the trustworthiness of Jesus because you have more faith and expectation in the judgment of God than the mercy of God in your direction. Right? Come on. I, listen, you can't get mad at me. I'm smiling. All right? Okay, you can't get mad at a guy that's calling you out and smiling while he's doing it. All right? This, this is, because this is, what are you building your life on? Are you more expecting on his judgment or his mercy? He puts his finger on the ear, not to bring judgment on him, but to minister his mercy to this man. Now, so my question for you guys is this. Is this, this is, again, this is what Jesus Christ did and this is what Jesus Christ always does because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Worship team, community team, why don't you go ahead and come on up. What, let me ask you a question. What, what's the disease in your life? Your marriage is imploding. Your family's imploding. You're an addict to pornography. You're self-medicating with alcohol in order to function in the world in, in sort of any regard of happiness. You're a social media addict. You're addicted to the dopamine you hit. You get when you get a like or a repost or, you know, you have over like 5,000 subscribers. Look at how awesome I am. Look at how many people like me and enjoy what I have to say, right? You're just an addict. You, you maybe, where's the disease? You, you don't know how to have healthy relationships, so you get together with other people. You gossip. You tear others down. You rip them to shreds when they're not there because you're actually a deeply insecure person. Where is the disease in your life? Is it sin? Is it pain? Is it frustration? Is it anger, hatred, bitterness, resentment? Do you have a hard heart? Where's your waywardness? Where have you taken trust back from Jesus? And then he's after us today and saying, look, I need that. And I want to bring a greater level of freedom to your life, but you have to give me that. Open the door. Do you trust me? Where is it? Allow him to put the finger on it. Maybe maybe it's, it's, it's the shame that you feel. How to find the disease? Where's the shame? Follow that to the root. What's there? What's, what's at the front of that line? It's the, it's the guilt. It's the fear of condemnation. Do you have fear in your life? What are you afraid of? Where's the disease? It's the regret that you care. Maybe you're here and you have uh, been wayward. You have walked away from Jesus. Uh, maybe you've never even given your life to Christ. And, and you're just at a point right now where it's just, he, you know he's been working on you in such a way where he's bringing you to this point where he's saying, I want to do that in your life. And here's, and you're trying to figure out, can I trust him? Can I actually trust Jesus, that he really lived, really died, really rose, really ascended, is really coming back again, and that he really is good, and that's going to work out personally, compassionately, and directly in my life. Friend, where's the disease? The communion table, you want to know what's so beautiful about the communion table? What we're seeing right here is what we can call the doctrine of expiation, and this is this idea that Jesus, what he does is he takes the sin away. He takes the pain away. He takes the brokenness away. Why can he do that? Why is it that when Jesus touches, healing comes? It's because he was wounded for you. The reason why he could touch this man and bring healing to him is because Jesus was about to start a march up a hill called Golgotha. Or in the words of Isaiah 53, it says that he would be pierced for our transgressions and sins upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds, we are healed. This is what Jesus does with this broken body and his shed blood. He's saying, this is why you can trust me. I mean, if you think about it, what, listen, okay, let me just, let me just pitch it at you from this angle. If he's going to give up his life for you, how arrogant of us to say, Jesus, I don't really trust you with this thing. I know you'll suffer, bleed, and die and give me your entire life, but 
but you don't know what's going on in my marriage, my family, or my personal, right? Like, how arrogant of us. And really, what we're saying also is like, hey, Jesus, I know you suffered, bled, and died for me uh, as the second person of the Godhead, absorbed the wrath that was rightfully mine because of my sin on the cross, but I'm, I'm still kind of struggling with this whole do you love me thing, Right? I mean, that's what we're saying. Like, what more does he actually have to do for you? He's given you everything. And friend, what you get to do at the communion table is you get to bring the proverbial disease. Maybe it's literal, maybe it's figurative, maybe it's a, whatever it is. And you get to come underneath the shadow of the cross and allow Jesus to put his finger on it, not to condemn you, but to heal you and bring deep transformation to you. Make that exchange at the communion table today. Allow the Spirit to search you out. Whatever is, because here's, here's the thing, guys. This isn't, this isn't just, you know, I know we talk about this often. We're not just going through the motions here. This isn't just like, get the cracker and the juice. No, no, no. Like, look, we have a conviction that the God of the universe is in this room and that this can be a pivotal moment for you where you experience the profound healing ministry of Jesus as you celebrate the work of the cross. You experience this healing personally, compassionately, and directly. Would you stand with me? And let's get ready to take communion this morning. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would fill this house with your presence in a greater way than you have yet this morning. I'm so grateful, Lord, that you near in moments like this, that you put your finger on the disease, not to further wound, but to heal. And I pray for your ministry, Holy Spirit, right now, as we celebrate the broken body, shed blood of Jesus, as we come to the communion table, we bring in view all that Jesus has done for us, that faith would arise, that trust would arise, that a greater dependence would arise. 